This is Pivot Out Loud, stories about education and life in a world turned sideways. I'm Lori Huff. I imagine a box, empty, a time capsule. It'd be something our family would methodically fill with mementos, souvenirs, and talisman from our family's most unexpected spring. I try to list the items we bury, try to imagine the artifacts that mark the COVID-19 pivot from our family's life attending the same beautiful school campus together before spring break to the awkwardly hacked home campus, we rushed into service as teaching and learning went fully remote. For longtime educators, Christian Long and his wife, Carla, life didn't stop as they faced a lot of upheaval during their pivot. Just as the pandemic was in full force, they put their house on the market and moved across the country from Texas to Ohio, all while continuing to work, teach, and parent. I was really moved by the way they captured the experience as a time capsule filled with memories, some universal, others unique to their family. This is Pivot Out Loud, and I'm your host, Lori Huff. So, have you preserved the memories of teaching and learning from this past spring? How are you holding on to the moments of your family collectively faking its way through turning living rooms into faculty lounges, flipping kitchens into science labs, accepting bedrooms had become a Zoom conference room? (laughs) All right, so here's what comes to mind. I imagine an empty box. Perhaps it's an old shoe box, certain to crumble deep within the soil. Perhaps something more elegant more refined, something worthy of being marveled at generations from now. But I imagine a box, empty, a time capsule. It'd be something our family would methodically fill with mementos, souvenirs, and talisman from our family's most unexpected spring. I try to list the items we'd bury, try to imagine the artifacts that mark the COVID-19 pivot from our family's life attending the same beautiful school campus together before spring break to the awkwardly hacked home campus, we rushed into service as teaching and learning went fully remote. First, a for sale sign. We'd place a for sale sign from the front yard. A real estate agent put it in the ground the very same day that our city formally announced shelter in place. It mocked us. It felt like a bad omen. We felt dread that nobody would tour our home, masks or otherwise. We imagined that the house would never sell. We leave it behind like Dust Bowl families long ago. We feared that we'd be jobless and homeless. After all, we'd just given our notices to move back to Ohio at year's end. We gave notice only days before COVID-19 forced to run on toilet paper across the country. All job offers disappeared overnight. The decision was right, the timing awful. Yes, we were excited to go home, but with COVID and a mocking hourglass expiring, we were near paralyzed by the path to get there. Oh, and we had to quietly feel all of that without sharing with anyone we worked with or taught. We just continued designing curriculum researching remote agile pedagogies and video methods, juggling hourly and daily shifts in class and meeting schedules, teaching courses, leading departments and divisions, collaborating with colleagues, future contingency planning on the school leadership team, advising heartbroken 12th graders, attending a tsunami of Zoom calls with parents, kiddos and colleagues and outside experts willing to help our students and keeping our house and homeschool perfectly clean for any theoretical home buyers that might ignore the city's shelter in place mandate to actually come visit. We were gut punched that we had selected to change everything seconds before a massive pandemic and social and economic upheaval emerged. We were leaving jobs, titles, salaries, benefits, insurance, predictability. COVID mocked us. Kids and colleagues needed us. We just crossed our fingers and prayed. The irony was laughable. The nervousness, not so much. The second thing I'd put in the box, a to-do list. Into the empty box, a carefully crafted to-do list, written in mom's handwriting. Always began with a list of chores, 
then school assignments, followed by recommended hobbies and lunch making tips. Finally, it ended with an empty checkbox, a do something physically active note, and a red heart. Each morning, we dutifully left our fifth grade daughter and seventh grade son a note for their day ahead. Yes, we were only rooms away, but we were also running a school, teaching classes, and trying to fake our way through flipping an on-campus school into a remote learning ecosystem. We had little time to see if our own kids were finishing homework, doing their chores, or eating a balanced lunch, so we left them a note and a red heart. We wrote notes for them to read in their morning pajamas. A good morning, a plea to review email inboxes, fill with their teacher's Zoom in directions, assignments, and follow up forget to tell yous. A nudge to eat fruit, put dishes away, and make beds. A plea that they juggle a soccer ball, or shoot hoops, or go for a long bike ride, or even co walk the dogs around the neighborhood. And we'd add a gentle mention that doing homework didn't mean it had to be done perfectly. Grades wouldn't really matter the same way anyway. There was now a do no harm school grading policy. We just wanted them to show up and learn. We just no longer put stock in their grade point average. COVID certainly doesn't care about grade point averages. Third, I'd add art supplies, thread, recyclables, random bits. Tubes of acrylic paint, misshapen cardboard pieces, expensive high-end sneaker soap, new iPad pencil, duct tape, sewing needles and thread, a DIY bird's nest, a massive stack of Walmart fabric purchased in a COVID panicked buying frenzy one March afternoon. Moment one, our daughter climbs a tree out back during class time, carefully places the bird's nest high up in the branches, an art and science project, carefully built from trash found in nearby streets, impressive construction, hands-on experiential learning, school at its very best. Moment two, our preteen son stands eagerly at the front door during his reading time, waiting for the mailman, expecting a shoebox to be delivered. In it, a previously worn pair of Hype Beast, aka heavily sought after, very expensive sneakers, he had just quote unquote won on eBay, planning to carefully refurbish them, then post the pair on his new shoe resale business Instagram page. Instead of dutifully underlying history notes or typing an essay, COVID gave him space to start his first business at 13, making money, keeping the mailman really busy. Moment three, our young daughter sits us all down at the kitchen table, carefully guides us through a slow, finger-pricking process of hand sewing, DIY masks. The mask would let us go to the grocery store in a community slow to accept the changing world around it. Found myself imagining society forever changed, the power grid going down, living off the land, a little house on the prairie family ready to hand sew all that we wore, led by 11-year-old girl with common sense and a gentle touch. Moment four, our 13-year-old son hand paints a no justice, no peace cardboard sign. School year nearly over, he had maintained straight A pluses, received several well-earned academic and community awards, but none of that seemed important. George Floyd mattered more. He held his sign above his head for hours at a busy intersection near our home. His first protest, no homework done that night, but plenty of work to be done. The kids created, made messes, became entrepreneurs, and daydreamed bold futures. The fourth thing I'd add, cookbooks and board game boxes. Depending on the room of the house you'd walk through, you'd see cookbooks on every tabletop. You'd also see forgotten puzzle boxes, board games from various closets, shoe boxes. And you'd undoubtedly see a laptop or iPad situated on top of any of those stacks. Whatever it took for your face to be level with the screen. It didn't matter how you were sitting, standing, or laying, just needed to be eye level. Screens filled with Zoom grids, Google Meet video faces, and FaceTime laughter. Awkward beginning of class waves, customary, can everyone hear me, teacher questions. Pondering which classmates had bad Wi-Fi 
or were falling asleep, panicking that you had emailed the wrong video link the night before, breakout rooms of kid teams brainstorming school projects, all grade faculty meetings discussing kids falling way behind, Friday evening English department remote dinner parties, admins crafting graduation events and lowering admissions rate contingency plans. The fifth thing, a DVD of NBC's The Good Life. Sprawled across the couch, we'd laugh at the limitlessly comical reasons Ted Danson, Janet the Robot, and mismatched protagonists remain philosophically imprisoned in the bad place. No plot or scheme changed their situation. Ironically feeling something similar, weeks and weeks of remote teaching and learning and mask wearing made real life seem like an inescapable sitcom with a dark soundtrack. We binge watch the Ozarks long after the kids fell asleep. Roll our eyes at the annoying marketing advice from YouTube families making six figures, opening boxes of random items sent to them by advertisers. Play Minecraft, Roblox, and endless hours of Fortnite. Stare in awe at hours of CNN live reporting protests. Research drive-in movie theaters open within 500 miles for a spontaneous family night out. Sometimes we just stare at the ceiling, wondering what day of the week it was, wondering what episode we were in, wondering if the boundary between TV and reality actually existed. Sixth, a Google map combining student homes and anonymous families. They were spread across the city, gated communities sounding of tennis and golf carts, worn downtown duplexes, repetitive track homes, sprawling ranches with fence lines to the horizon, apartment complexes, mini mansions on tiny lots, modest houses reminding you of your not so flashy grandmother's loving home. We spent many afternoons coming to campus to pick up freshly made meals by a joyful school kitchen team, meals for families that could not yet come back to campus. Meals for families without anyone to check on them or the resources to eat well. We deliver meals to families in all neighborhoods, poor and not so poor. We'd smile, say hello, stand six feet away, and we'd tell them we were thinking of them. They'd smile, they'd say thank you, stand six feet away, and tell us what a nice surprise it was. Other afternoons, we caravan in a line of faculty cars, celebrating soon to graduate 12th graders, honking horns, singing, taking photos, hanging out swag bags of school gear to near alum, putting congrats signs in the front yard, all from a safe social distance, just shy of the front door. Driving home, we'd sometimes wonder if we should quickly head to Sam's Club to just in case hoard by cooking and cleaning supplies. Other times we daydream of selling everything, moving into an RV, just in case everything fell apart. More often, we just felt gratitude to see our students and new friends, mask to mask, door to door, home to home, street to street, neighborhood to neighborhood. Seventh, I'd add photos of all types. There would be countless pics, random B-roll captures, blurry candids, lots of day in the life snaps, quirky homeschool moments, new normal portraits of all types. There would be a photo of all four of us, parents and kiddos, sitting at the dining room table, attending four separate Zoom meetings at the same moment. None of us thinking the least bit surreal, but it was surreal and the new normal. A photo of Carla dressed to the nines, standing at a podium on the school campus, leading a formal live video middle school award ceremony. Her students in a grid of photos, lounging on their beds, attending from home, including our son, on the same call, up in his own bedroom. A photo of our daughter in tears on the first day of remote learning. She began with near Christmas morning excitement, fired up for virtual school after an extended spring break to give teachers remote teaching prep time. She was wide awake, pencils lined up. 30 minutes later, she felt overwhelmed avalanched by loving, well-intentioned teacher emails, filled with paragraphs of we miss use, remote learning advice, class expectations. 
more than a dutiful fifth grader could carefully take in. We hugged her deeply, told her to take a break. It was day one of remote learning. Our lover of all things school was already drowning. There would also be a photo of the four of us going on a long bike ride in the middle of the school day. We needed a break. School felt optional at times, often even as school administrators and teachers and parents. And it would be a photo of us packing our house into boxes, preparing to move across the country, uncertain employment, uncertain social dynamics, uncertain political shifts, and much uncertainty about whether school would ever return come fall. And certainly many photos of us laughing at dinner time, leading and attending Zoom classes in our pajamas, School baseball mitts and travel soccer cleats gathering dust in the garage. Two dogs who never had so many mid-school day neighborhood walks in their lives. Like many of us, life didn't stop for the longs during the pandemic. When I caught up with Christian, I wanted to know if things had settled down following their big move back home. (laughs) Well, literally, we're in central Ohio in a small town by the name of Granville that's about half an hour outside of Columbus uh, in a college town where Denison University is located. So we actually returned to the community that we had previously lived in. And the major difference is that we're renting a home as we kind of get our feet back on the ground. And and we're looking at hopefully next summer uh, being able to move into a property of our own. And as my daughter and I talk about, uh, we hope to have chickens again. So our first goal is to build a chicken coop when that happens. But yeah, we're back in the same community. Our kids are back with their previous classmates and teammates. We're getting to, as best we can in a COVID era, we're getting to cross paths with friends and and colleagues alike and uh, just appreciating me back in the Midwest again. How are your kids doing in a new school? Sounds like they figured out ways to learn in different ways when you were back in Texas. How's that going for them now? They are doing incredibly well. You know, I think the other day, my wife, Carla, she and I were joking that in some respects, we are spending more energy just thinking about them as young teenagers than we are about their transition. In many respects, they have adapted. They've adjusted. They're in sixth and eighth grade. They're with teammates competing, and they are going through school in many respects as much as school can be in this day and age. So we spent a lot of time just thinking about like, you know, have they made their bed and is their Chromebook plugged in and who's going to take, you know, one of the kiddos to soccer practice and pick the other young person up from basketball practice. So I think in the good news is they've adapted. They were excited about the return home. And for the most part, school is fairly normal for them. They ride the school bus. They've chosen the option of being back on campus. Certain families in our community have opted to stay at home and be virtual. And so in the general day-to-day respect, they are normal kids going through a normal sixth and eighth grade. And then there are these moments where we think, oh, okay, things are a little bit different. One of our kiddos, his teacher asked them to use a piece of software that I think if it hadn't been for COVID, most teachers wouldn't be using in this day and age. So I think for us, we recognize two things, that he had a teacher that tested it at his previous school last spring, and he did really well with it. And then this fall, when a new teacher said, hey, we're going to try um, using this tool, he was like, hey, no problem. I've already used that. And so I think we're finding those moments a lot. They are really quick to adapt to teachers trying new things. And for the most part, as long as they're back on campus, they feel pretty good about that. But I suspect if we do have to readapt to a virtual situation, whether it be for a week or a semester, our kids will make that adjustment pretty quickly and pretty comfortably. What about you? How have you adjusted as both an educator and as a parent? Well, we as parents, while our kids, you know, get on the bus each morning, we pick them up after practice uh, at the end of the day, both of us are working out of the house. So in certain respects, our kids had their COVID semester last spring, and now they're back on campus, a new campus, of course, but, you know, things are pretty normal for them. We, on the other hand, I think last semester was a good field test for Carl and I to, you know, to kind of figure out how to create our own space, you know, like so many people, how do you create a space in your home that you can kind of protect and get away to? But at the same time, you know, family space is more important than your office space. So how, you know, for instance, my desk is right in the family living room. 
And there are times where I'll have a client meeting that, you know, they're in a different country, different time zone, and I have to figure out where I'm going to go. So I carry a monitor plus my laptop to another room, another floor, so that the family can keep the living room as family space. And then other times when the family's gone, I'm just in the living room, but the way it's set up, I can sort of feel like I'm in, uh, in an office that's unique to me. Your essay was framed around this idea of putting memories from this crazy time into a box, sort of a time capsule uh, of your time with your family at home. What would you put in there now since the essay was written, since you moved? I love being asked to rethink about that because when I first wrote it, it felt more poetic or more of a metaphor. And when I think back to the spring, you know, I think one of the first things I would put in there, it seems really laughable now, but I remember the night that we recognized our kids were going to spend weeks, minimum weeks, studying everything at home and, and being online. And, and we would have all of these moments of the day that were going to be unorganized. So the very first thing we did, probably like a lot of other families, is we wrote this kind of ridiculously detailed schedule of the day. So we immediately were like 8.30 X and nine o'clock this and break at this time. And, and it felt really purposeful. And within three or four days, it was useless. It didn't work. It wasn't an honest reflection of how our kids were learning or what we as a family needed or what our colleagues who were our kids' teachers, they were going to need from our, our young people. And so I think I, the first thing I would do is I would put that really naive schedule right in the box. It was a sincere effort in the first couple of you know hours to frame the day and to remove some of the ambiguity. But over the months that followed, what really became clear is we needed to put more energy into where are each of our kids at that moment. And I don't mean physically, but what was their energy level? And we as a family, what did we need more than anything? So what we found is that bike rides and walks were far more important than homework schedules. And I think on essence, I would put something that would remind me of the bike trail moments that we took as a family. It was the first time that we just jumped on our bikes as a family and multiple times a week, we just went out for a ride. And there was nothing grand about it, but you know, to be honest, it became precious. And now that we're back in a, in a somewhat normal moment where our kids go to school every day, those bike trips don't happen. Our schedules are much busier now than they were, and we're moving in multiple directions. And so I think I would put not only that naive and sort of laughable family schedule that was up on our family refrigerator for a week or three till we took it down, I'd put that in and I'd put some remnant from the bike trail, maybe a photo of the bike trail itself, maybe, you know, a water bottle, just something that would be indicative of it. And then I think, I suppose what I would put would be a couple of um, assignments that our kids did that were both suggestive of doing what their teacher and the course needed them to do, but also were creative responses that showed as a parent, and I suppose as an educator thinking about my kids, but as a parent more than not, that our kids would figure out really unique reactions to and responses to the assignments and challenges they were given. And, you know, I suppose there's always that art project or that assignment that you hold on to because you think decades from now it'll be important for that grown adult to look back on their childhood. But I can think of a couple of assignments, one where our daughter collected leaves and grass and rocks and random things from the neighborhood. It was a science project. And then she was asked to design an animal from scratch using those found objects around the neighborhood. And she created something that was really fantastic. And it wasn't necessarily a project the teacher would have done in a non-COVID moment. It was very much inspired by the moment, like get out of the house, go on a family walk, find things, and then turn that into a more creative response than maybe a typical science class. So I like that it reminds me that teachers all over the places are trying to use whatever they think that family or that young person has within reach. And it also reminded me that my daughter, in that case, came up with something I never would have thought that she would have tried. It was a totally different reaction to the assignment, and it was worth noting. It was worth kind of smiling at. It was, I think it would be the kind of object I would put into the, the box as well, because it would be symbolic of both her creative output, but just as importantly, how all of us as educators, all of us as parents, and all of us as learners 
We're trying to just make good with whatever we have access to and still make progress. Well, Christian Long and your future chickens, um, <laughs> thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me about your family's pivot. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm Lori Huff, the editor of Ed Magazine and host of Pivot Out Loud by the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Thank you for listening.